You may know him best as Sulu from Star Trek, but actor and activist George Takei also has a darker story to tell. During the Second World War, thousands of Americans of Japanese descent were forced from their homes and sent to internment camps. George Takei was among them. And he just sat down with Ahari Srinivasan to talk about his new memoir, where he revisits this dark period in American history. So most people remember you as Sulu from Star Trek, but well before that, as a child, you lived through three American internment camps. Uh, what do you remember about that first day when the soldiers came knocking? The uh, soldiers came, pounded on our front door with their fists, uh, a sound that I still remember. I, I mean, I think, I thought the whole house sh uh, trembled yeah. when uh, they were pounding on the, on the uh, door. At gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home, a two-bedroom home with a front yard and a backyard on Garnet Street in Los Angeles, and taken to a nearby uh, racetrack, Santa Anita Racetrack, and we were assigned a smelly horse stall to sleep in. All five of us, three children, I was the oldest at five years old, and my parents. For them, it was a degrading, humiliating, painful thing to take their three children to sleep in this narrow, smelly, I mean, still had the yeah. pungent stink of uh, horse coming manure. from your home. From our home. And so Santa Anita is kind of your first stop. And, and we were there because the camps were being built uh, 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 during that time. We were there for about four months. And when the construction was finished, we were put on trains with armed guards, armed soldiers at both ends of each car and transported two thirds of the way across the country to the, to the swamps of Arkansas. How are your parents dealing with this? People were despondent, depressed, angry, or fearful. Uh, and my, uh, and we, there we were in, in, the, in a cleared swamp. And when it rained, it turned right back into a swamp. People had to make that trip, uh, trek to the uh, mess hall three times a day. And for the uh, older people, their feet would sink into mm. the muck and they didn't have the strength to pull their feet out. So young men had to carry them on their backs, which meant the young men's feet sank even deeper. Uh, and uh, so uh, an idea came up to build a uh, boardwalk for connecting each of the barracks. And they, they asked my father to be the block manager. Yeah. And so he organized that. So my father became something of the leader of the uh, camp. And uh, for me as a kid, my daddy was a block manager. He yeah. had power. Yeah. He was making speeches at the end of each meal. So uh, for me, it was a, an exciting, I mean, a, as a five-year-old child yeah, yeah. with a daddy who's the... Uh, head of the uh, whole uh, operation. You know, there's a, a survey that you mentioned in the book that uh, everybody had to take, and it's uh, question number 27 and 28 are pretty interesting. Number 27 says, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And then number 28 says, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the U.S. from uh, any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces? and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor, to any foreign government power or organization. So what were the answers to those two questions? And what Let the me consequences? take you back a, a little uh, further to give you the, the uh, back, uh, background for that. Yeah. Immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, young Japanese Americans, like all young Americans, rushed to their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the U.S. military. This act of patriotism, and that's what it was, was answered with a slap on the face. They were denied military service and categorized as enemy alien. Made absolutely no sense. But that it was a time of hysteria and fear and panic on the part of the United States. And they took everything from us, our bank accounts, our businesses, our homes, impoverished us, and then put us behind barbed wire fence with sentry tower, machine guns pointed at us, 
At night, when we made the night runs to the latrine, searchlights followed us. You, you had no not charges. committed a tr crime, right? No right. crime. In fact, they couldn't even charge us uh, with any crime. So there were no charges and therefore no trial. Due process, the central pillar of our justice system, simply disappeared. And a year of imprisonment under these circumstances, then they realized there's a wartime manpower shortage. And here are all these young people that they could have had, mm. but accused of being enemy aliens. We were neither. How to justify drafting people out of a barbed wire prison camp. Their solution was this so-called loyalty questionnaire, mm. which everyone over the age of 17, man or woman, 17 or 87, had to respond, respond to. Now, can you imagine my mother? I was a kid, my brother was a younger, my baby sister was now a toddler. She was being asked to bear arms to defend the United States of America. The country to that's in prison. defend the country basically. that's incarcerated us. And she's supposed to bear arms to defend that country. That was preposterous. I mean, abandon her children. Tw question 28. We're American citizens. We never even thought of a loyalty to the emperor. We're Americans. They assume that we had a pre-existing Allegiance. Racial loyal, uh, right. loyalty, allegiance to the emperor. Right. So if you answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, that no applied to the first part That's of right. the very same sentence. Will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then, then you, you were confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor, and now we're prepared to forswear that and repledge your loyalty to the United States. It was a no-win question. Yes, you lost, and no, you lost. So your parents said no to both? My parents said absolutely not. Uh, we have principles, we have intelligence. Uh, the, the people that are putting this together are reckless, ignorant people. So what uh, happens then? They were ca categorized as disloyal, and we had to be transferred from the Arkansas camp to another camp in Northern California, right by the Oregon border, called the Segregation Camp for Disloyals. This segregation camp was the classic epitome of overreaction. It had not only one uh, barbed wire fence, but two more, three layers of barbed wire fences and a half a dozen tanks patrolling the perimeter. Mm. Tanks, they belong on a battlefield, not intimidating citizens that were uh, goaded into outrage and put into this even more outrageous and uh, uh, idiotic, uh, crushing, evil uh, circumstance. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine an entire government immediately doing this to an entire population of American citizens that lived among them. Right. But you talk about in the book, the attorney general at the time, who goes on to become governor of California and a Supreme Court justice, the views that he was holding, other senators were holding at the time. And what was openly said is something we would consider racist today. Racist and 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 vicious vilification. The attorney general in California at that time was a distinguished man, but he was also ambitious. He had his eyes on the governor's seat, and he saw that the single most popular issue in California at that time was the lock up the Japs issue. Lock up the Japs. There's that rhythm that we still hear today. Mm. And this attorney general, this ambitious man, saw that to, in order to be elected governor, he needs to be in front of that issue. And he made an amazing statement as the Attorney General of the State of California. He said, we have no reports of sabotage or spying or fifth column activities by Japanese Americans. And that is ominous because the Japanese are inscrutable. They, you can't tell what they're thinking behind that placid face. So it would be prudent 
to lock them up before they do anything. So for this attorney, the absence of evidence was the evidence. And he became very popular, got elected governor of California, re-elected twice, served three terms, and then appointed to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. His name went down in history as the liberal Supreme Court Chief Justice, Earl Warren. And he never owned up to it while he was alive. This is what we, what we had to put up with. When you see the images now on TV of what's happening on the southern border, what goes through your head? Horror, terror, disgust, and it galvanizes me. We've got to put a stop to it. We are Americans. Th this act is not American. We know what American values are, our ideals are. We will oppose them tooth and nail and show that the United States is a humanitarian country and we will offer our hand in aid to people that are suffering. We are Americans. Look, I can see a, a supporter of the president sitting here right now saying, hey, listen, I will agree that what happened to you as an American citizen is a tragedy and a travesty, but the, that happened to American citizens. These are not American citizens that are on our border wall. These are people who are trying to come into this country, right? I mean, there are lots of people who justify what is happening right now and say that it's different from what you went through. At the core, it's the same mentality, mindset, this sweeping characterization of people who look different. If you really understand those people that are coming here, they're coming from uh, places like Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, the, where it's ca sheer chaos, violence, and poverty. Some of the people, some women have seen their husbands shot right in front of their eyes, and they are literally fleeing for their lives. Asylum is legal. And we need to uh, respond as human beings. Yes, they are not citizens, but we share in common with them our humanity. And we have, as Americans who feel for other people, and, and we have a history of doing that. The uh, Marshall Plan after the Second World War devastated Europe in ruins and hungry. We uh, 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 gave them aid and brought their economy up. And so that contributed to a, a better global economy. And we have to think like that. We live in a global uh, economy, global politics, global culture, and we need to connect to each other as human beings. Why do you think that this, this period in history, the internment, that there's a gap in understanding between generations. Why did elder Japanese people not speak about this in their families? What they experienced was profoundly wounding. It was enraging, it was painful, it was anguishing, and they wanted their children to, to build their lives in this country without being expo exposed to the same thing that they did. And so they didn't talk about it. That's not too, mu too different from veterans of the war who didn't want to talk about their battlefield experience with their children. The graphic novel is just the latest attempt you've made here to try to keep getting this story out. You also had a show on Broadway a few years ago, and uh, there's also Allegiance. A Allegiance, and there's now a program on AMC. I think some of the directors and producers, they have their grandparents lived through this or unfortunately died in Hiroshima or other places. Right. I mean, it's, that's, the idea of Asian representation on TV is still somewhat an anomaly. I mean, it's only the rare show that gets a full cast of people of color, right? And they're usually, sometimes they're marginalized into smaller networks or they're the exception, not the rule in the network lineup. And here you are having been the lone Asian character, really representative of the entire Asian world on Star Trek. And here you are, you're just playing a part in this very rich cast. And it's starting to happen with greater frequency. Yeah. This isn't the only production. Yeah. And it's rooted in the reality of uh, uh, Japanese American history here. We've come a long ways from when I started my career back in the 1950s. 
uh, when the roles were all the silent servant or the, uh, the com comic buffoon or the evil villain. Now we're having substantial stories like the terror infamy with its deep roots in American history. This is important because it's an American story. I consider it my responsibility to tell the story in an effort to make the future of America a better one than the ones that we've lived through. You've grown up and lived through eras where it would have been illegal for you to marry a white woman, much less a man. A my, my aunt was in love. This is shortly after the war ended with a uh, white man. It was illegal in California. We had an anti-miscegenation law. But for 11 years now, I've been married to a white dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we are making progress. George Takei, thanks so much.